Picture 50 feet of baby blue Christmas ribbon one inch wide. String it in a circle on edge on the floor and put a candle in the middle. Now expand the scale. The ring world was a ribbon of unreasonably strong material, a million miles wide and 600 million miles long, strung in a circle 95 million miles in radius with a sun at the center. The ring spun at 770 miles per second, fast enough to produce one gravity of centrifugal force outward. The unknown Ringworld engineers had layered the inner surface with soil and oceans and an atmosphere. They had raised walls a thousand miles high at each rim to hold the air inside. Presumably, air leaked over the rim walls anyway, but not quickly. An inner ring of twenty rectangular shadow squares occupying what would have been the orbit of Mercury in Sol System gave a thirty-hour day and night cycle to the ring world. The ring world was six hundred million million square miles of habitable planet, three million times the area of Earth. Lewis and Speaker to Animals and Nessus and Tila Brown had traveled across the ring world for almost a year, 200,000 miles across the width, then back to the point where Lyre had crashed, a fifth of the width. It hardly made them experts. Could any thinking being ever have claimed to be an expert on the ring world? But they had examined one of the spaceport ledges on the outside of the rim wall. If the hindmost spoke the truth, they would need no more. Land on the spaceport ledge, pick up whatever the hindmost expected to find, and go. Fast. Because... Because within the regular telescope image that the hindmost had set before them, it was painfully obvious. The baby blue arc of Ringworld, the color of three million Earth-like worlds, too far away for detail to show, but banded with midnight blue from the shadow squares, was well off center from its sun. Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. Larry Niven never intended on writing a sequel to The Ring World. It was originally planned to be a standalone novel, but as the years passed, the mountain of mail Niven got regarding the problems with his Ring World and his storyline kept piling up. Niven says in a preface that he wrote this book because of all the quote-unquote unsolicited help correcting things from his first novel. <laughs> I think that's a nice way of telling us he's sick of our nitpicking. <laughs> Ringworld Engineer starts off with Louis Wu on the Planet Canyon with a wire in his head. He has become addicted to current. You see, when a wire is implanted in the correct way into your brain, it can stimulate the pleasure centers. Depending on the amount of current, it can make you slightly happy, or it could turn you into a grinning vegetable, or anything in between. Most people start off light and become more and more addicted to the feeling. Many stop caring about the rest of the world and starve to death, with food in the fridge, only feet away. Some gangs would even use this as a way to kill people, forcibly implant a drought, as they are known, cut the cord short so they can't move without unplugging the cord, turn the dial up to max, and then plug them in. They would usually stay there, grinning, until they died, unwilling to unplug the drought, even just long enough to cross the room for food and water. This is how Louis Wu looked when the two men broke into his apartment, grinning, sitting peacefully, with a drought in his head. Louis Wu was under the wire when two men came to invade his privacy. 
He was in full lotus position on the lush yellow indoor grass carpet. His smile was blissful, dreamy. The apartment was small, just one big room. He could see both doors, but, lost in the joy that only a wirehead knows, he never saw them arrive. Suddenly, they were there, two pale youths, both over seven feet tall, studying Lewis with contemptuous smiles. One snorted and dropped something weapon-shaped in his pocket. They were stepping forward as Lewis stood up. It wasn't just the happy smile that fooled them. It was the fist-sized drowd that protruded like a black plastic canker from the crown of Lewis Wu's head. They were dealing with a current addict, and they knew what to expect. For years, the man must have had no thought but for the wire trickling current into the pleasure centers of his brain. He would be near starvation from self-neglect. He was small, a foot and a half shorter than either of the invaders. As they reached for him, Lewis bent far sideways for balance and kicked once, twice, thrice. One of the invaders was down, curled around himself and not breathing, before the other found the wit to back away. Lewis came after him. What held the youth half paralyzed was the abstracted bliss with which Lewis came to kill him. Too late, he reached for the stunner he'd pocketed. Lewis kicked it out of his hand. He ducked a massive fist and kicked it kneecap, kneecap. The pale giant stopped moving, groin, heart. The giant bent far forward with a whistling scream. Throat. The scream stopped suddenly. The other invader was on hands and knees, breathing in sips. Lewis chopped at his neck, twice. The invaders lay still in the lush yellow grass. Lewis Wu went to lock his door. At no time had the blissful smile left his face, and it did not change when he found his door fully locked and alarmed. He checked the door to the balcony bolted and alarmed. How in the world had they gotten in? Bemused, he settled where he was, in lotus position, and did not move again for over an hour. Presently, a timer clicked and switched off the drought. In his current adult stupor, he leaves them there for a few days, rotting until a puppeteer literally appears before his eyes. A stepping plate. Louis Wu had seen these on the puppeteer homeworlds. Nessus had even brought some along to the ring world. The puppeteer uses a neuronic whip, knocking him unconscious, and brings him to his ship, where he finds speaker to animals, also incapacitated by a whip blast. They have both been abducted by a puppeteer, and it's not Nessus. Here they find out what happened to Herlalo Prililar, the native from the ring world that had both tortured them and saved them before they brought her back to Earth. Or here they are told the official story anyway. They say that only one year and five months after Pril came to Earth with Louis Wu, she died. She was given booster spice, the human anti-aging drug, and it either had no effect or it had the opposite effect. She was thousands of years old when she came to Earth, and once she was given the booster spice, she rapidly aged and died. So why was she given booster spice when she had brought back with her the perfected version from the ring world? The government claimed it was stolen, but she was only ever in world government custody on Earth. So someone within the government stole the perfected spice? That is all the information we are given, but it leaves a massive problem. In the original Ringworld novel, it is stated that each use of the Ringworld drug stopped aging for 50 years, and taking more at once did stack the effect. So the chances she ran out of her last dose in the year she was on Earth is only about 2%, 1 in 50. Now this is possible, but highly unlikely. It seems to me that we were never told the full story. Maybe Niven just needed to get her out of the way for this novel, but the entire point of this novel was to close loopholes, so you would think Niven would not make another glaring hole like that just to have an excuse to put Lewis under the wire. A plot point that has little payoff later. So I'm going to give Niven the benefit of the doubt and say that there was some dirty things going on with Prill that we may never fully find out about. Unless I'm forgetting something from the later novels. 
This is why I reread each one before making a video on it, to see what I forgot. So Lewis, along with Speaker, now named Chmi, now that he's earned his name, but who I will still be referring to as Speaker for obvious reasons, no way I'm saying Chmi a hundred more times, are placed in a slaver stasis field for the trip back to the ring world against their will. It turns out that the puppeteer taking them hostage is the former hindmost, the leader of all the puppeteers, the one Nessus was married to as a reward for the first Ringworld mission. He was deposed and believes that if he can find the fabled transmutation device that was speculated to have existed in the first novel, as the only way they could think of to create enough of the scrith that made up the Ringworld Foundation, then they will again appoint him hindmost. Not so much as a reward, but because such a device would require his experimentalist political faction to deal with it, something the current conservative faction was not equipped mentally to do. The puppeteers are cowards after all. Courage, like Nessus in the former hindmost show, is considered insanity in their species. But sometimes that specific brand of insanity was needed, and they all knew it. The hindmost was now trying to create one of those times with this matter transmuter. When they questioned Prill about the device in the first novel, she said they used them on every ship to convert lead to fuel. But when they arrive in the Ringworld star system, they are shocked to discover that the Ringworld is off center from the star. One side is much closer to the star than the other, and it's getting worse. How could this have happened? Why is it happening now? Hominids have been living on the Ringworld for almost a million years now. The former hindmost seems completely indifferent to the fact that when the Ringworld collides with the star, hundreds of billions of Ringworld residents will die, maybe trillions. But the hindmost just wants his matter transmuter device. So they land on the rim spaceport of the Ringworld and begin to search a derelict ship left there for who knows how many millennia perfectly preserved in the vacuum of space. But as Speaker and Lewis search the ship, Lewis informs Speaker that he had been doing a lot of research into Prill's claims while he was on Earth, and a lot of them didn't add up. She was obviously playing them for fools, telling them whatever they wanted to hear. First and foremost of all, her people did not make the ring world as she claimed. Her people evolved on the Ringworld and became its dominant race once the previous one died off, it seemed. Her people's tech would only ever work on the Ringworld. It could not be the tech that predated the Ringworld. It would have to be a different kind of tech that far surpassed what her people had, amazing as it was. Lewis knew that her ships could not be powered by lead. She had made that up, only considering what the most dense element was but lead would be a detriment in almost every way. Even steel would be a much better choice, as at least steel can strengthen the hull. Well, lead would be a stress on the hull. And yet her people's ships were made of steel and not scrith. Lewis did not say this where the hindmost could hear, however, as he feared that if the insane puppeteer found out that he and Speaker were useless in this failed mission, he would abandon them there. Why risk bringing dangerous aliens back to their homeworld when they were kidnapped and upset with him for it? If he left them there, the Ringworld would impact the sun in about a year. There was no chance of them getting off the Ringworld in that short amount of time to seek vengeance. Lewis noticed something odd about the ship they were searching. It was mostly steel, which raises the question of where they got the steel on the Ringworld a land with no metal deposits and no earth to mine in. Upon failing to find the device, they decide that they will search on the inside of the rim wall. Speaker takes them up to the top of the thousand mile tall wall in a small excursion vehicle. Here they survey the land below them. Other than the typical ring world geography, they see what appears to be an entire floating city. Thinking that if any high tech still exists on the ring world, it would likely be there, so they set off in that direction on a hundred thousand mile trip. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, 
and most importantly, subscribe so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.